Yeah. 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 It gives me great pleasure to formally welcome Professor Deepak Kumar, who is um, Professor at the Zakir Hussain Center for Education and Studies at JNU. And Professor Kumar has written extensively about sci the history of science and colonialism and history of technology in colon under colonialism. And he's recently uh, done some work on the, uh, col colonialism and the medical encounter. Uh, so, Today he's going to talk to us about what we might, what is now called knowledge society and information technology. So, thank you for coming here, uh, Professor Kumar. Welcome. Thank you for giving me an opportunity, friends, to come here. I had heard of the college, but never got the opportunity. I had been in the neighborhood all around, but uh, it's good to be with you. And. <clears throat> Actually, um, I'm not enamored of the use of the term knowledge society, but these days, because everywhere being last decade or so, knowledge society, knowledge economy being discussed, I thought, why not uh, think about it? And uh, especially, you know, when this new century came, 21st century, there was enormous hype on the century itself as a century of knowledge and so forth. So as a student of history, I tried to look back when to how did our forefathers at the turn of the 20th century thought about the onset. You know, 1900, the high moon of the empire, Kurzion at the, uh, at the helm and so forth and some steerings taking place which later unfolded as Swadeshi movement and so forth. But very few people talked about 20th century in terms which you see now, the hype. Hype was missing. It was a very sober analysis of what has happened earlier and what was going to happen. Phase of transition, when the cultural encounter had already taken place in Victorian India and then people knew uh, uh, what to expect from the government, how to move forward and so forth. And all this, you know, as, as you, have, you, you, you are aware of, unfolded itself in Swadeshi and Faraj and so forth. <coughs> uh, those days, the term used was not really knowledge. Uh, most of the 19th century uh, documents talk about education. Even the term development is not being used. Development is post First World War term, which Vishwaraya was one of the first to talk about in 1980. <coughs> 19th century, the term used is improvement, material and moral improvement of the people, you know, the, under the benign Raj. So, improvement. And what role education was to. Again, uh, interestingly, most of the colonial records talk about the purpose of education. The purpose of education, they talked in terms of character formation. Even today, unfortunately, we have internalized it. And most of our schools, you know, early teaching, said was the character formation. As if people are born with deficient character. No, they are not. But still, you know, character formation has always been, and this is a colonial legacy where we put emphasis on character. If we go further back in historical craft, then you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, different notions of knowledge per se. Uh, in our tradition, uh, knowledge was looked upon, uh, you know, there are a couple of terms which are used. One is Gyan, which comes closer to our understanding of knowledge. The other is Vidya. So the, the popular Sanskrit shloka is Savidya ya vimuktaya. You know, the education that, that liberates you. 
When we use the term vidya, there are two things which come quickly to mind. One, it's a process. Knowledge is not a process. Gyan is not a process. Gyan could be, you know, an end in itself. While, not, while vidya is a process. But this process liberates. Liberates against what? Liberation, what kind of liberation? Liberates from hunger, from disease, what kind of liberation? That has been left out. Gradually, it is the spiritual connotation which became more important. So liberation of the soul. That is the purpose of Vidya education. While in the Western Hemisphere, the way the Greek philosophy and history, tra the trajectory moved, it was taken more in terms of power, control. First understanding, then control. To understand the nature, control it. Bible itself gives the, you know, human, the, you know, after the creation, the power over. So, a, a lion is to be called a lion by the man. It is he who gives that. So, all the power has been delegated to humans. And uh, that power was to be utilized the way they wanted. While in our system, in, in, in Asian philosophy, uh, 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 knowledge was looked uh, not in terms exclusively of power or control, rather it was more abdication, you know, when the self melts, boundaries melt and so forth. Uh, this, however, doesn't mean that our system of knowledge uh, was uh, uh, oriented more towards the other world. That means, you know, uh, 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 paravidya, which is, you know, the other world. Uh, not apara, which is this world. In Islamic system also, the, there is a division people have talked about, ilm dunya, ilm adhyan. So, ilm has always been discussed in Islamic system also, where, you know, in the However, uh, the, the argument one can make is that it would be wrong to surmise either in ancient Indian knowledge system or in early medieval or late medieval when Indo-Islamic knowledge system comes to the fore, you know, ilm dunya was ignored or reason was ignored. No. In ancient literature, you come across several terms like yukti, which is reason, anvishki, which is investigation, um, hetuva, dialectics, and so forth. So ancient Indian literature, right from 6th century BC to 6th century AD, you will have several instances when our shastras and sangitas talked about logic, talked about what you call Tarkavidya, talked about investigation, talked about experimentation also. For example, Charak, 2nd century BC. All the time he puts emphasis on experimentation. Then only you know the knowledge of the body. Shushruta goes to the dissection of the cadaver also and he, he had a probably a better understanding of the anatomy than many other civilized society at that time. So, <clears throat> so uh, the, 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 the emphasis on aparavidya, that is, this worldly, had been there and very strong. Unfortunately, most of our, you know, especially in colonial times, uh, you know, most of these things were, were uh, not brought to the, to the fore. And uh, thanks to a lot of work being done in Oxford and many other places, uh, uh, you know, India was looked upon more in terms of spiritual legacies than material. Uh, and, and this is another aspect of knowledge evolution in our country, in our society, we should look at is that it had been slow and incremental. Knowledge didn't move in our society through what, for example, Kuhn would say, paradigm shift. No. 
So knowledge in our society moved through writing nighantus, commentaries, mm. and you know several several names have been given to it, but mostly by writing commentaries. In Ayurveda, you have nighantus. In um, philosophical tradition, you have Vedanga. You have several other uh, Sangitas, Mimansa, and many others. So they are, they themselves, one takes doesn't involve a paradigm shift. No. It is subtraction and, you know, some subtraction, some addition. And the corpus of knowledge kept on growing. It was never stagnant. No. Writing commentary is a valid and civilized way of advancing knowledge, which was done in the ancient Indian society. However, there were certain difficulties because sometimes when a particular knowledge becomes what you call, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about it. When a particular society develops a particular form of knowledge, which you may call Shastra Sammat Gyan, canonized knowledge, when a particular set of knowledge becomes canonized, gets the sanction from different sections of the society, especially the dominant section, the Brahmanas, then it was very difficult for others to challenge that dominant paradigm. So Shastra Sammat Gyan could not be challenged. For example, in 6th century, you have an astronomer called Brahmagupta who knew why uh, the eclipses take place. He knew that it was because of the shadow of one falling on the other. But by that time Puranas had already established that it is Rahu who does it. So, so Brahmagupta goes a step forward, says that it happens because of, uh, uh, as a true astronomer, he explains it, but then goes two steps backward, saying no Puranas must be correct. We can't challenge the Puranas. Purana being a canonized knowledge. Shastra Sammat Gyan. This goes on. It happens even in 18th century when Jai Singh is there. You know, Jai Singh could have been the father of modern India much before, a century before Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Here is a man who has all the ingredients of a path-breaking knowledge system. Here is a prince. He is a town planner. He establishes a new city. He is an astronomer builds remarkable observatories, which are true, correct observatories, of course, masonry, but the results were correct, the yantras, who uh, makes a panchang, Zizeh Muhammad Shahi, Muhammad Shah was at that time the Mughal ruler, and so forth. But still, and he brings, what is more important is, he brings a number of astronomers to his royal court, it was some sort of a royal society of astronomers being established in Jaipur without calling it a royal society. But you know, there were several Vidyadhar, Jagannath, many others, more than 25 astronomers graced his court. But he was advised by his uh, people not to go beyond the Sangitas. Therefore, his system remained Ptolemyan. His system remained within the framework of Indo-Islamic and most of his Punjang, the Jis, was dependent upon a more than three century old Jizya Ullu Khani of Samarkand, Ullu Beg. He couldn't transcend that barrier. What Brahmagupta felt in 6th century, Jai Singh was feeling the heat again in 17th century, 18th century, 18th century early 18th century. Now this was a some sort of a limitation on our knowledge system. This limitation came to be discussed for the first time by a scientist called P.C. Ray. You may have heard his name, he was a great chemist and of course freedom fighter. Swadeshi movement, he played a role, he became a Gandhian and so forth. Probably an iconic teacher, he was true Acharya, Acharya in the true sense. P.C. Ray wrote exactly a century ago when Hindu Swaraj was being drafted, he wrote uh, History of Hindu Chemistry. And there, like a sociologist, he gives the explanation of why knowledge became 
कुंठित और कॉन्स्ट्रिक्टेड इन द इंडियन सिस्टम बिकॉज ऑफ द कास्ट इट इज अगेन सिक्स सेंचुरी मानुषा गीता एंड मेनी अदर द वे कास्ट डेवलप्ड एंड द डोमिनेंट सेक्शन द कैप्चर नॉलेज द रिजल्ट वॉज दैट इंडियन सॉयल बिकेम ग्रेजुअली इनफुटाइल एंड वॉज अनेबल टू प्रोड्यूस ए बॉयल ए हार्वी न्यूटन और सो पी सी रे गिफ्ट वेरी डिटेल्ड एनालिसिस एक्सलेंट एनालिसिस ऑफ दिच आई थिंक वी नीड टू टू टेक इट इन टू अकाउंट यू विल योर सेल्फ नोटिस दैट नाइन्थ सेंचुरी वी हैव द ग्रेट फिलोजोफर शंकर इंस्टेड ऑफ युक्तिवाद शंकर आर्ग्यूज दैट ही वुड प्रेफर अनुभूति एक्सपीरियंस एक्सपीरियंशियल नॉलेज नॉट तर्क शुष्क तर्क he says shushka tarka will not give us the real mati mati means wisdom shushka tarka was not enough to explain wisdom so knowledge doesn't lead you to wisdom but experience may lead you and experience then theology comes so whether it is the islamic variety or buddhist variety brahmanical variety whatever religion becomes very very important when anubhuti comes after all you know all these revelations are anubhuti which buddha undergoes or the prophet undergoes or whatever happens experiential knowledge now this distinction between anubhuti and tarka becomes very acute and 10th century onward people begin to accept anubhuti more that is why 13th 12th century onward till 19th india who had been probably i would argue even now have been obsessed with what i call social engineering not material engineering not real engineering so we have ramanuj we have nana kavi all oh, you know great chaitanya and so forth they all talked in terms of you know bringing cohesion in the society social engineering. or gradually to the what these days also there are babas who talk in terms of inner engineering and uh, there are gurus and sadgurus i don't know what inner engineering is but uh, in th- reality the god of the engineers who is he vishwakarma was relegated to a lower position in the pantheon nobody worships vishwakarma he goes down similarly even our modern doctors they do not worship dhanvantri or you know so we have gods who are mostly unproductive and you know they, they are at the top of the trinity the tribe mostly unproductive people who work with hands had been pushed to the periphery of the society so the carpenters the potters and they had no way they produced iron they produced remarkable works in terms of you know the iron pillar in delhi metallurgy or textile and everything but they had no way to theoretically explain it because the garbagra of the society remained confined to a dominant section therefore artisan and thinking people there was a disjunction as pc re argued disjunction between hand and the head so people who worked with the hand now compare it with here here artisans contributed to the development of physics more than whom you would call proper physicists people grinding glass the artisans ordinary people who manufactured what later became microscope they were not professor of physics or natural philosophy but the people who were working in my society unfortunately we because we have a very harsh sun we wanted to keep the sun out uh, you know our study of light took another shape for us light became noor in a while in the western system they had to tap light you know so you see the, the, the use of glass stained glass and so forth and glass as you know is optics is physics 
Glass is not an ordinary thing, it's a man-made thing. And right from your spectacles, which we didn't use, we had surma and other things, right from spectacles to modern chip, mobile chip, it's all extension of glass technology. We missed that. We missed on certain counts. It is not that we didn't know how to make glass. We were making bangles for 1,500 years. Bangle beads have been found in archaeological. But my society didn't move beyond bangles. Jai Singh was unable to appreciate the significance of telescope. Jesuit fathers had given him a telescope, but which he uses. But he was unable to, and that's why he was not able to comprehend, probably he didn't know anything about Copernican revolution, which had already taken place 150 years before. Here was a man who could have the harbinger of modernity, lost the opportunity. Much later, of course, Ramon Rai picks it up in a famous letter to Amherst, which you know, he talks about modern, he doesn't use the term modern, but European science and literature, but this is what he meant. And his successors like Devil Tagore and etc., they talked about, they accepted it, the Brahmos, when they used the term knowledge in terms of Atma Prate, knowledge in terms of, uh, you know, Vijnan Mulak evidence and Swata Siddha evidence, which is easily understood and the other which is put through experimentation. Late 18th, early 19th century, you have great changes taking place. But this is, however, not to paint a dark picture of the medieval times, no. There was one mistake, like the Brahmins which created uh, a very segregated knowledge system. Unfortunately, what India had received in 13th century was Ghazali Islam, post-Ghazali Islam. Not the Islam of the Mustalite, not the Islam of Ibn Sina, Ibn Haytham, Ibn Rushd, no. We received Ghazali Islam, that is why most of our maktabs which taught new knowledge during 14th, 15th, up to 18th century, were more oriented towards theology, what you call mankul, not makul. Makul is one where reason is used, akal is used. In Arabic you know the term akal, a lot of emphasis was put on it, but Ghazali had put the lid on that. Ghazali made a break, very strong break, when he argued that everything is to be attributed to God, nothing to physical properties. For example, when he was asked what burns, if cotton is burnt, what burns the cotton, he would argue it is God who burns the cotton, not fire. This was a huge difference. Fire has its own physical property. Cotton has its own physical property. Both are dismissed. It is attributed to the ultimate Lord, etc. So you have this kind of, uh, you know, not 9th and 10th century Islam, not even Al Biruni's Islam, but 13th century, and this created some sort of a difficulty for the Indian knowledge system. Some people tried, the Dara Shikok, for example, tries to but didn't succeed. There are certain examples when the Vaidyas and the Hakims collaborated, brought each other together, but, uh, you know, a paradigm shift doesn't occur. We didn't produce a Harvey, so our knowledge of anatomy remained, uh, remained uh, incomplete. When Shushruta knew it better, later it degenerated. We couldn't produce a correct picture, so, you know, much later, Arya Samaj founder Dhyanan Saraswati in Haridwar, when, you know, he, he, he was told about Kundalini, etc., so he fetched a dead body in Haridwar and himself dissected it to find out where is Kundalini. He couldn't find it, so he said it's all bullshit, forget about it. One of the reasons why Arya Samaj in many ways takes a modernist stance Many of the articles, they would try to identify, you know, that Western knowledge is, was already there in the Vedas, of course, go back to. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, he does, he tries this in late 19th century. 
But up to 18th century, up to, for example, you take Shah Valiullah's uh, uh, Madarsa in Old Delhi, 17th century, 18th century. What was the curriculum? The curriculum was mostly theology oriented, jurisprudence oriented. Islam is a huge jurisprudence oriented knowledge system. But not relating to hikmat or, or relating to the, the falsafa. Falsafa went down. In Lucknow, we had Darsen Yag, Darsen Nizami, Darsen Nizami, a Shia center where some emphasis was put on falsafa, but uh, still theology remained strong, theology and jurisprudence. In 19th century, this knowledge system undergoes certain changes because in Victorian India, as you all know, there is a cultural encounter. People begin to ask new questions. There is impact of positivism and so forth and many other things. Darwinism comes mid 19th century. It created a lot of a problem in the Judaic Christian world, but not so much problem in Indian society. So, you know, we, we, we accepted it as part of incarnation and so forth, evolution from aquatic form to the higher form of life. In 19th century, you have number of cultural interlocutors who tried to identify Indian tradition with what was coming from the West and see that they are synthesized, to see that there is no contradiction. Even Muslims, Muslim scholars, Ubaidullah in Calcutta, Afghani, Jamaluddin Afghani visits India, the great, you know, the founder of pan-Islamism, they all start saying that modern knowledge was not at all incompatible with canonical knowledge. Both could coexist. This is a new development which comes in latter half of the 19th century. And it is critically uh, uh, assessed. You know, Syed Ahmad very critically looks at Indian tradition, Islamic tradition. In fact, he was so critical that the Matwalli of Kaaba called him, gave a fatwa, Vajibe Katu, Sayyidana. Because he argued that, you know, you don't have to look for scientific principles in the Holy Quran. Holy book is meant for social relations, for personal guidance, for moral improvement, not for finding uh, scientific explanations. And there were many like him. In, even in Bihar, can you imagine? A feudal society like Bihar in Muzaffarpur in 1880s, there was a Bihar Scientific Society, which was established to talk of in terms of reason, without being antagonistic to religion, without putting reason versus religion. They were trying to to develop, to include, to introduce new knowledge among that. In early 20th century, you have this development which take which gets institutional support. So you have new institutions coming up, the universities of course, the colleges, and the most important societies. So you have Indian Science Congress, you have several other organizations where societies, professional societies are formed. Now these professional societies also condition the development and understanding of knowledge in modern sense, in modern ways. Unfortunately, after India gained independence, of course we had the continue to establish institutions. Today, if you look at, uh, my apologies, I'm moving very fast so that I can leave you some time for, for discussion. Um, uh, in post-independent India, of course the number of institutions grew. We still keep on establishing new institutions without caring to maintain the older ones. But, um, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, these days, you know, you think of anything under the sun and there would be a national institute devoted to it in my country, isn't it? Everything. There is a goat research institute, potato research institute, anything you think of it, there is one fluid place at the government of India with central funding. <coughs> so, institutions proliferated, but did it lead to cutting edge knowledge? Nehruvian India made a sincere attempt. I personally feel that India began very well under Pandit Nehru, post-independent, despite the massive 
tragedy called partition and so forth. In 1950s, when I was growing, I didn't suffer communal instincts, though I had every reason because I was immediately, you know, within 10 years of partition, I was looking at Hindu, you know, and Muslim relations. I was watching it in my own muallah. I should have been, but it didn't. Despite the massive tragedy of partition, 50s India was much more secular India, 60s India. Nobody talked about caste. My parent didn't tell me what caste I belonged to. My teacher knew my caste before I knew it in July school, and so forth. There was what people, uh, Nehru was absolutely sincere and correct about instilling scientific temper. This is what scientific temper is the term which I would consider to be crucial to any knowledge enterprise. Today, unfortunately, 80s onwards, we have taken to knowledge in terms of uh, a certain sector of knowledge, which is tech-oriented, um, high-tech, and gadget-oriented, and so forth. And what kind of gadget? They are not manufactured or innovated within India. No, they are all imported. It comes from MIT or somewhere else. It's Nokia which provides for someone else. We have developed what is called service sector. Is this service sector really knowledge sector? Is Gurgaon, Bangalore real India? This is what knowledge India should have been? Sometime I, you know, I'm reminded of Pandit Nehru in the famous Freedom at Midnight speech, when the world sleeps, India awakes. Probably he didn't realize that his descendants should be awake whole night in Bangalore while the whole world sleeps. What prophecy it is? How shameful. Whole world sleeps and my children are awake whole night. I know my own nephews, nieces, my children work there. Is this the new India which Nehru envisaged? Is this the knowledge which we talk about? Is this the cutting edge knowledge? Is this the scientific temper? That's why, you know, 80s onward, we have more communal instincts, we have more deterioration in the society, uh, strife, etc. Because scientific temper gradually, you know, nobody talked about it. We were, in, we were obsessed with technology import. Import, that's all. No import substitution. Easy to import. Be it my army, be it my scientific institutions, and so forth. What happened? Many times I'm asked, as a student of colonial history, how is it that colonial India produced such wonderful names? At least five, six physicists you can easily say. Meghnath Saha, Sevi Rama, Satin Bose, J.C. Bose, etc. Post-independent India, can, can you give me five names? Where did they go? What happened? And whatever name we have are either based in Chicago or in Cambridge. They may have Indian origin, but they are Americans. What happened to the Indian institutions? Calcutta University, a stinking mass now. In the name of excellence and knowledge excellence, we have centralized knowledge. So five IITs, one JNU, for a billion plus you need a hundred JNU population. And even that excellence doesn't figure anywhere. If I ask you, give me five names, India is a pathological reservoir, huge reservoir, pathological, all diseases are there. Five medical names, you would be hard put to name them except UN Brahmachari in 1920s or so. They are all busy promoting medical tourism and huge hospitals and nursing homes. In education, maximum emphasis, what this Birla Ambani report says, etc. You know, can you imagine? These new rich have the, are approached by the government to tell us what education should be. Nobody bothers about Kothari Commission and their recommendations. And now they are telling us that higher education should be more market-oriented. 
what kind of market and privatization they are talking about. Syed Ahmad started Aligarh experiment as a private initiative. Malvi started it as a private initiative. These were the real private efforts. Today, privatization, does it mean that? No. It's a black money being transferred into educational institutions. We need to critically examine. And the turn of the century, as I began earlier, it began 21st century with a big hype. That hype is really, really unfortunate. It still refuses to die down. It has taken new garb, you know, globalization, etc. We were global even earlier. All the time we have been global. We were never xenophobic. We have always been open. Was it have Kutumbukam? We talked thousand years ago. So what is new in it? It is crass commercialization. You are peddling as globalization. It is illicit wealth which we are promoting as privatization. And this must be critically looked at. This must be brought to the notice and the state must be persuaded not to withdraw from knowledge sector. The state has to play a very strong role, important role at Pandit Nehru had envisaged with emphasis on scientific temper. It is only with that temper that knowledge would become useful for the Indian society. By creating call centers, you are not serving the cause of knowledge. As I said, you know, you give me five names, you can't. Most of my students migrate. And cutting age researchers, if you look into scientometric studies of last 15, 20 years, you will see it's a downward trend. China has overtaken us in a huge way. Even Taiwan is ahead of us, Hong Kong, Singapore. What to talk of the American universities? Why it is happening? Our brightest students, they go for engineering, they don't become engineers, they join Deutsche Bank. Is this knowledge society? Is MBA knowledge society? Why should the young youth should be obsessed with MBA? I had never heard of it when I was going. Never heard of. I couldn't imagine that I was joining. <laughs> Even Tata Company, which is highly reputed, I haven't, I haven't touched it. Now it's a nexus has developed, huge nexus, where knowledge is at a discount, where material, immediate profit is. And nation building will not take place with immediate profit. Nehru was absolutely right. He laid a foundation slow, steady. And most of the people along with him, whether it is Mahal and Obis, Meghnath Saha was critical of him. But both had their valid points. Meghnath Saha differed with uh, um, Baba and many other, Bhatnagar. But at least they were sincere in their efforts. You can't challenge Bhatnagar's uh, uh, sincerity in creating knowledge-oriented institutions. Unfortunately, I'm reminded of, and this is where I stop. In 1954, Bhatnagar's close associate A.V. Hill, he was secretary of the Royal Society here in London, A.V. Hill asked him, the papers are there in Churchill College, Cambridge, asked him, Bhatnagar, you are establishing a number of institutions and these government institutions are attracting people from the universities. Now good professors from universities are leaving their job there and joining research labs like NPL, NCL, and all kinds of, there were 40. Today, CSR has more than 50 labs. So are you not dehydrating the universities? Because the good teachers want to leave. Where will the second crop come? First crop goes, but it is the university which provides you the next generation, third generation. Come, what are you doing in the name of excellence? Then Bhatnaga replied, saying, as early as 1954, he, he was himself, you know, Bhatnagar was chairman of UGC. Bhatnagar himself was a professor at Lahore Chemistry. He was vice chancellor of BHU, so he's a great man. He says, I do not see great future for Indian university system in Nehru's time. Because vice chancellors are being appointed on political grounds. And when the education system will crumble 
at least my laboratories will remain as centers of excellence. Now this was a very, I would say, myopic. My centers, my laboratories as centers of excellence. When the nation goes down, what will, where in, you know, what will you do with OSIS in a desert? Desert will someday eat you up. This is what happened. Allahabad, which had Meghnath Saha, which had uh, Kothari and many others, see what a state of affair it is. Patna University, all the universities which you may call Mufassil universities have gone down. Lucknow, Punjab, Chandigarh. And in its place, everybody talks about only JNU or one institution, and IIT or IAM and so forth. Or Indian Institute of Science, one Bangalore, that's all. One IIS. How will you create a knowledge society with such a deficient structure? And it will, it will call for massive state intervention to, to make up. And with this Bhattagar episode, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kumar. Questions? Feel free. I, it, I've been, my apologies, I didn't open my, but I forgot about it. If you want, you can have a quick look. Government is keen on bringing foreign universities into, government is keen on bringing foreign universities. Idea is to bring more uh, efficiency into the university system. Will it work? I do not think so. Because these foreign universities would come with a very narrow focus and in limited areas. Three, four, five disciplines. That will not help us. And foreigners would not give you the cutting edge knowledge that they will keep to themselves naturally. So, sitting in Hyderabad, if you think you will have a Harvard degree, I mean, even your own friends would say, oh, this is Hyderabad-based Harvard degree. This is not a real Harvard. LSE has lots of, in Okhala, LSE has opened shop there. And my relatives who got admission, they said, oh, he's studying in LSE. How can you have LSE in Okhala? And can it be the same? You open there, open. You will go there for one month to teach. That will not make a substantial change. Sorry about it. And you would be, you know, only those areas they will open where there is money, where the high fees can be taken. I'm told that one of the university has started a huge, I mean, has already bought 500 acres of land in Hyderabad. Probably this is, which, which one is this? Yale or yeah, yeah, something. Now 500 acre of land if you buy at a reasonably low price, I mean in itself it's a huge return, it's real profit. Who is bothered about the students? It's the land which will give them a lot of money later. So, no, no, no. I think we must go back to the educational spirit of our nationalist leaders, forefathers, early. 20th century, take inspiration from them and build up <coughs> the Peruvian vision. Rajiv Gandhi was wrong, unfortunately. And later, many other changes that have taken place last 20 years, I do not see great future. No. We should have continued with with early 20th century idealism, when we played a, a formidable role in knowledge generation, on an equal footing, on an equal footing. Post-independence, still 1960s, 70s, you have Jain Ramchandran establishing a great institution in Iraq, great success. We haven't been able to maintain it. Today you go, what a state of affair it is. 
we have to salvage that first instead of allowing foreigners and these you know how can you live on blood transfusion you have to create the blood cells inside you can't transfer on transfusion you need cells to grow inside and this is what our people did in 1670 we have to maintain except few others have perished few have survived you know, after all we have tifr we have many other bar some of the government institutions iis but they are too small in number for a billion plus population why the rest have perished whether we are doing the right thing in the name of what we call excellence i am opposed to this excellence business because excellence leads to centralization and centralization whether it is of knowledge or of wealth is wrong is counterproductive in the long run so these days everybody is obsessed with centralization ugc gives grants potential for excellence and some four or five universities will be pumped a lot of money the others is stuck you have a scarce resource what is excellence excellence should sprout even in a mofasil in a very small as you see in cricket for example excellence has come from ranchi but why not in academic from ranchi university isn't it you have to care for it you have to patronize it and you have to have a a justifiable look into the funding agencies if you make an analysis of the funding agencies you will see how partisan they are in their grants 70% would go to iisc bangalore or to some very established csir lab how is it this i'm not saying you starve them no augment the plant itself so that a, a quality product can be done even at a limited level at bhagalpur and guntur but i think this will uh, thank you sir for that present uh, just wanted to ask about how do you explain the difference between the gulf between universities and schools in india in terms of the popularization of science i mean i have i have in mind something as basic as basic as textbook design in science and then the way textbooks are read in schools the way people approach the whole question of theoretical science and applied science because if you look at history writing in india and the recent changes in the ncert curriculum for which a lot of jnu and du professors play a large role but that is sadly not happened as far as science education is concerned because that could perhaps play a play an important role in getting the right kind of people to study science at the universities so far as the school education is concerned i won't be that critical no as i am a fire education the school system works under great limitations within india and despite the difficulties absolutely enormous in mofasil area as many other places the schools have still and no lab facility at the 8th 9th 10th class with very little no chemicals etc is still till the age of 18 our students have done well that is how you know look at the number of students who appear at for iit examination they may not make it finally but this doesn't mean that they were really inferior the gap is very narrow those who have been left out and look for some other way or those who make it the gap is narrow the school system has served india i understand better than better than the higher education system 
Now, so far as the curriculum is concerned, uh, our curriculum upgradation is a, is a regular process. And in some states, for example in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, science curriculums are highly appreciated and that's how they produce more number of uh, engineering graduates or medical and other you know, science oriented graduates than NCRT, wherever it's writ runs, uh, has, a, has, a, has a competent production system. And the school syllabi, I would think that, you know, a lot has been done. And it is not that deficient. Problem begins after the year 18. When we are unable to retain or train that intellect to real innovative studies, for several reasons, lower middle class families, they want quick money. They look forward to placement when they are in college itself. This term placement has become very popular these days. Even in the small areas they ask for, Achha, placement ho gaya. It might be, you know, a very third class institution, some money, you know, goes placement. Now what this placement means? At the age of 20, I had not heard placement. I remained unemployed till 26, running around here. There, there is no way placement didn't exist in my vocabulary. Nowadays, a 18-year-old boy wants to be placed quickly because of money requirement. I understand. Lower middle class, they are aspirations and so forth. There has to be something has to be done to wean them away, either through scholarship or, as I suggest all the time, the crucial word is temper. If the temper is instilled at the age of 16, 17, 18, he will go for it. If the temper is not there, you lose on that. So, so probably uh, a school system is not that, def that deficient as the resources post school. A scholarship is very important. The scholarship which, they could, which could take people from <coughs> placement oriented jobs to anthropology for example or interdisciplinary areas <coughs> where they can be given. Social sciences are going to suffer in this scenario who will study history these days? Even in GNU, I, you believe me, it's the worst that we get. And out of that worst, the best we export to Oxbridge. So I'm left with the residue. <laughs> you can imagine. So social sciences are going to suffer. But well, I don't, don't mind that. At basic sciences, we need people who are able to innovate, who can make long-term investments, personal investment, the societal investment, which was being done in 1930s, 40s, 50s, even 60s, 70s. It's only post-80 that, I, you know, I see. I'm not a, I don't believe in a decline theory, but I say that the trajectory has moved veered away for whatever be the reason. So can I ask a final question? Uh, why would you not consider humanities and social sciences knowledge? Why do you think it's only the sciences that constitutes knowledge? Because we have produced in, in the last 50 years um, I think social sciences and humanities are absolute excellence. Uh, well, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, 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 social science, well, we need social understanding for the sake of polity, for the sake of governance, growth of civil society. Social sciences are very important. But they have been there. The critical mass war has been there, successful. 
I see the lack of absence of similar critical mass in other places where my students are caught by market orientation. I'm worried more about that because then innovation will not come. In social sciences, we do have the critical mass. Social, civil society is fairly strong in India. Who says? My journalists, my uh, uh, publicists, my NGOs, my judicial system, fairly strong. And then one can be proud of even in our democracy, which has taken roots, many things. So that's a success story. I'm worried about the innovation part, where social scientists can contribute by spreading what I call, again, again what Meru called scientific temper. Do we social scientists promote that scientific temper or not? By and large, we have. Among the social scientists, you won't find many fundamentalists. No. Or gender uh, chauvinists. No. They have provided a leadership. There is a, is a critical mass and they have done it. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't believe in two cultures. They should march, they should, but, uh, but uh, it is the techno-scientific culture which we need to strengthen and be given, of course, social scientists play a role there. Unfortunately, most of our, you know, as you see that uh, uh, most of the violent jihadis, uh, they have technical training. They are engineers or doctors. Even Hindu right wing, what they have cyber sun. Cyber, huh? many they are the cyber people. They are very, I mean, so so it beats my intelligence. They are the social scientists play a role when you know both come together. And it is really surprising that, uh, but no, I'm, I'm I'm not really surprised because the kind of engineering education we provide has produced more robots than anything else. That's why it is happening. That robotization must stop, mm -hmm. and there the social scientists will play a role. Mm -hmm. Two points. One's a, a general understanding of um, some of the historical thinking. Here. One's actually a question. Uh, the first is you mentioned you, you, the impression I got was you segregated the internal and external knowledge. Mm. Uh, external being synonymous to the Western Hemisphere, the idea of knowledge, and internal being that of India. Now, from my reading and my understanding, um, a lot of science-based um, Western literature and a lot of research has deep roots in philosophy and theology. A lot of their greatest mathematicians, scientists, um, all have a very strong undercurrents of philosophy, spirituality, whatever you name it. Even to sort of the modern, say modern age, um, even to the extent that Einstein has um, a lot of his writings have a very deep philosophical and spiritual um, slant. Um, and to the same degree, on the Indian side, it, so I think the point I was trying to make was it, there's a it's it, it's not I, I find it's not as clear cut as internal and external because. scientists or <coughs> mathematicians that well, but um, at least in the Western Hemisphere, it's, it's, it's not just the external, there's an internal element to it as well. Um, that was one. The second one was about your current, you're saying how the students you train, or a lot of students go abroad, they train in India and they go to America. 
America, Oxford, the, the West. Is that merely down to sort of financial um, rewards, or is it sort of grass is greener on the other side? And so, let's move. Excellent. <coughs> Thank you very much. The first one you are rightly you have rightly said that uh, you know even post Renaissance. Uh, didn't mean that the abundant religion, no? Why should they? Uh, even Darwin, despite having caused probably the maximum damage to the creationists, you know, he remained a practicing Christian and he <coughs> didn't get into this, this debate at all. He became a recluse and remained. Uh, in fact, he had his, uh, what is called, his own bulldog in, in Huxley, uh, who tried to defend Darwinism to the outside world. And there is a lot of debate going on whole of 19th century. Uh, <coughs> you know, uh, Huxley introduces in 1869 a very interesting word. He says, science not opposed to religion per se, but to theology. He makes a distinction between theology and religion. So theology, many of these Newton was a deeply religious man, not a theologian, when he provided the mechanistic view of the universe. Many others will come later. So this distinction we have to keep in mind. And in West, despite the chapel, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, they all grew, not around tombs and mausoleums, but around chapels. They are all seminaries, basically. But these seminaries didn't prevent them from pursuing what you may call natural truths. Natural truths. So a process of secularization was inherent. Today, you know how the church is so divided. They haven't yet elected a pope. And uh, there had been a separation between the church and the state. There had been a number of other uh, within the, you know, Christianity is not a monolith. There's numerous. Uh, uh, religion is not a monolith. There's numerous disjunctions and punctures inside. And thereby, the process of secularization could move. And it, has, it continues even now. The lab is not interfered with by the chapel. The lab and the chapel coexist, isn't it? This is the beauty of Oxbridge. While in my case, unfortunately, we do have, we had, for example, a Kerala School of Mathematics in 16th century, 17th century. Very strong Kerala School of Mathematics. You know, read a book by one of my friends from Manchester, that Crest of the Peacock, Non-European Roots of Modern Mathematics. Penguin King. Or we both come. Now, there the problem was that these were limited to certain agraharas. Few Brahmin tolls and families. So knowledge was so controlled. We were obsessed. We, in medicine also, we wrote lots of commentaries in 16th century, 17th century, which were advances over the previous knowledge. Still, their spread was very controlled. As you know, you know, our knowledge system, highly Brahminical. Many people were outside its touch. It's miles away from its pain. And we have been obsessed more with, as I suggested, social engineering. While Europe was producing Harvey, Vesalius, and Leonardo, and many others, Galileo, we are known for our bhakti movement, isn't it? Nana, Chaitanya, Kabir. Or to Nami ni milte aap. Dhungi 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century history. That's why I came to, from Brahmagupta, I jumped to Joy Singh. Of course, in between there were people. You know. Bhaskara is there, many other 11th century. Alberni comes. And Alberni says, Look, what can I do? In, you know, he has a whole chapter on mathematics in astronomy in his Katabul Hind. He learned Sanskrit also. He says, you know, the Brahmins are so arrogant, it's very difficult to engage with them. And in India, 
gems are mixed with cow dung. So the whole knowledge, you know, you, how do you take the gems out of cow dung? It is so difficult. Eleventh century is complaining. It. Situation continued for a long time, even after the arrival of the British. Probably it continues even now. So how do you explain? Why our obsession with social engineering? Even today, it is the issue of reservation which bothers us more than scientific temper. Do you expect anything from people like Mayavati? Knowledge? Does she know anything about it? Is she worried about it? <coughs> or many others? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm all for social change and everything. Look at it. Right from the great uh, Shankara down to Ambedkar, it is social engineering. And the more we did, the more problematic the society became. The more we talked of caste, the more casteists we became, the more we talked of communalism, more communal we became. My apologies. Oh, sorry. So, <clears throat> so, oh, sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, to, talk, to compare the two hemispheres would be wrong. Many people have talked about why India didn't have a scientific revolution. You know, the famous Nidhamian question, why China? China had its own Mandarin system, we had our caste system. So we couldn't, we didn't have a scientific revolution, much less an industrial revolution. We fell prey to colonization. Colonization lay in the logic of history. It is not a policy that we lost. We, lo we had lost earlier, I mean, even before a shot was fired. Because in the realm of cutting edge knowledge, we were not there. So, so, second question was uh, about the... Uh, grass is green on the other side. Uh, uh, rain, rain. Oh, oh, no, no. No, no, I'm all for, I'm all for drain. I have no problem. You know, I have millions and millions. I can export if they open the, yeah, I can export several millions. No, I'm not worried about that. No, 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 no not at all. Let them go, and I don't say that they go there for making dollars, no. They go for knowledge. Because sometimes, yeah, my own daughter went to the United States to do PhD because she felt that she would have more lab and better facilities. I couldn't stop her. I didn't go abroad because I was happy doing history, which is a very innocuous subject, harmless. So I could do it in Calcutta and in Patna. But when you need uh, big funding, when you need uh, a son to, so you need to go to Geneva. Fine. It is not that they go for dollars, no. So they go because, but sometimes I do lose my students. There was a student who is now teaching, Prakash Kumar, some Pura agriculture, he wrote a book, yes. Yeah, so he was registered with me a year, he was with me. And then he moved. He said, sir, I'm born to go to Atlanta. I said, fine, you go. But I don't know whether he went there for John Creed, but, uh, but uh, fine, you get $2,000, why not enjoy it? It was good to work with John Creed, I think. Whatever it is. I'm happy. Millions, you open the doors, I'll be very happy to export few millions. I have no problem with that. I don't believe in drain. Are drain to garmi ho gaya mare? If you remain home, then my drain gets more clogged. I want people to go out, expand, capture the world. <laughs> this is what it should be. It is rather brain gain for us. I never believed in drain, even earlier in 80s, 70s. I myself didn't go, but uh, you know doesn't mean that I didn't die, I won't be, because, you know, it is gain for us. At least, uh, you know, you can do, do a good job, produce more books. And so. However, one thing which I object to is don't try to glorify, remain critical. Remaining at home, one thing which I learned is more to self-criticism. Recently I saw a book by uh, 
Dr. Prasannan Parthasathi on why Europe grew rich and Asia remained poor. Have you seen this book? Yes. Yeah. There he has a whole chapter on. There is a whole chapter on 16th, 17th century science technology, 18th century. And unfortunately, he almost argues that India had everything except Newton. Now you can't do, say that. There was a lot missing in our own society. As I said, we had a lot of other things. My trajectory itself was different. We had bhakti. Bhakti mein yukti kaise hoga? There was no yukti. No reason, less reason. Less akal. Very few people were engaged with that. Indo Islamic society, and that is one of the reasons, whatever you use today in India, I tell this, including your electricity, how much things which you use are of Indo Islamic origin? Anything. Except my food. We lost something somewhere. We should accept and try to compensate that we don't lose again in 21st century when new kinds of developments take place, when new colonization takes place. Even this. It's not my product. I'm using it all at all of it. Millions and millions of India is hooked to mobile. It's a sm small country, Finland, which produces Nokia. Look at it. And that a company alone will have the, the turnover of several states of my country. And well, isn't it? How does it happen? How do you how do you confront? I'm not asking for counter. How do you confront it? How do you face it? Indian state and Indian society will have to think over, and thereby, I, my recipe would be to go back to the Nehruvian moors. I may be wrong. We go back. We develop the temper, the society, the cohesion, emphasis on knowledge creation, institutions you build, but see to it that they deliver, and so forth. And of course, the money. There is a scarce resource. However, most of my money goes to the to security purposes, to defence. What kind of security is this? Will it give us real security? Do we have food security? Today we are exporting rice, but few years later what happens? Two, three monsoon failure and India will have food rights. A more salinity of the soil and we will, we will face problems. It's a huge, huge population, Virgin. So, so... We need to prepare ourselves accordingly, not to look at the West, but to generate within. And that is why early 20th century is very instructive. I would look to Malvi, I would look to Syed Ahmad, I would look to many of those examples, and Indian Science Congress deliberations and so forth. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your talk today. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you.